The Church in the DR Congo, A Personal Perspective. Part 1, Prologue. What brought us to Africa? In a presentation at the 2018 Fair Mormon Conference, I shared stories of some of the faithful saints in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Kinshasa. In this series of presentations, I would like to speak from a more personal perspective, reflecting on the meaning of that experience for Kathleen and me, and pondering some of the dynamics of numerical and spiritual growth of the church in that country. The 20th century saw not only impressive beginnings for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Africa, but also an explosive growth of Christianity overall on the continent. According to Philip Jenkins, during that time the number of Christians grew from 10 million to 360 million, representing an increase from 10% of the population to 46%. By most measures, Africa should within 30 years contain more Christians than any other continent. An expanded church presence will decidedly bless Africa, and likewise, continued growth in Africa will certainly reshape the church. I will begin this seven-part presentation with a prologue about some of the important milestones in the history of the church in West Africa. This will be presented through the eyes of my mother and father, who served in Nigeria twice beginning in 1980. I will then give a few of the circumstances of our call as a couple of senior missionaries to the DR Congo. I will continue next with a brief snapshot of the history and situation of the church in the DR Congo. Then I will say something about the young missionaries who served there and discuss a few of the many reasons why the Congolese are naturally attracted to the church in such great numbers. Next, I will introduce the concept of centers of strength through a brief video of President Jean-Claude Mabaya, former Area 70 and a current counselor to the mission president. To further illustrate this concept, we will go to some of the newer areas of the mission in outlying cities within the Congo. We will also see how the idea of centers of strength not only applies in a physical sense, but also in a social sense. After this, I will highlight the construction of the Kinshasa Temple, a light to the Kadir Congo and to the entire world. Finally, I will discuss the need for additional senior couples in the DR Congo and many other parts of Africa, concluding with my own testimony and that of President Mabaya. Before beginning the story of what brought us to Africa, I'd like to say something about the great joy of full-time missionary service. I hope that our story will encourage some of you who have been planning for missionary service after normal retirement age consider whether, whether you might be able to leave earlier than you might have thought possible. The Lord unexpectedly opened many doors for us as we prepared for our mission. And during the course of our mission, we have never been more healthy, never felt more calm and assured, never worked harder, and never been happier. Of course, everyone's situation is different, and each person has to consider their individual circumstances. The Lord does not intend for everyone to serve a full-time mission because he also needs many, many of us to perform significant service in our own wards, stakes, and communities. He needs dedicated parents and grandparents, good neighbors, kind friends, loving ministers, devoted family historians, temple workers, and online missionaries. The important thing, of course, is not where we are called, but how we respond to the particular calls that come to us. Recently, I met a dedicated missionary couple who had spent several years in different parts of the United States supporting addiction recovery. Our dear friends Bob Day and Sharon Alsop Day, who served as welfare and humanitarian missionaries while we were in Kinshasa, are now serving a three-year church service mission at the River Meadows Retirement Center in Alpine, Utah. The church has a fully operative branch for the senior citizens who live there. Bob serves in the Elders Quorum Presidency and Sharon teaches Sunday School and Relief Society. In addition, they are assigned a minister to the complex and sometimes urgent needs of up to a dozen residents at any one time. Like many of the members in the late 1970s, my parents, Mark J. and Elma Singleton Bradshaw, followed the prospects of church growth in Africa with great interest. After arriving home from an outing with friends in June 1978, I remember vividly seeing my mother burst out of our front door to shout the news to us about the newly announced revelation that made temple and priesthood blessings available to all worthy men. Our neighbor, Edwin Quayle, Ted Cannon, Jr., 
had supervised the Africa area as part of the church's international mission. Three weeks after the announcement of the revelation, President Cannon was sent to Nigeria and Ghana with Merrill J. Bateman to make an initial assessment of the prospects for sending missionaries to West Africa. Afterward, Ted and his wife, Janeth Russell Cannon, were sent with another couple, Rendell Noel and Rachel Ivans Wilson Maybe, to serve as rev representatives for the international mission of the church to West Africa. They returned in 1979, having established 35 branches and five districts of the church in Nigeria and Ghana. Upon the return of the Maybes and the Canons, my parents began exploring the possibility of serving a mission in earnest. My father, who had previously served as a bishop or counselor to Ted Cannon, wrote, quote, After talking with the Canons at length about their adventures and the interesting people they met and learned to love, we were very excited with the prospects of such an adventure for ourselves. Our call to serve in the Africa West Mission came in July 1980, and the mission president, Brian Espenscheid, was eager for us to come to Nigeria as soon as we could arrange everything, so we prepared to leave in September 1980. My parents sold the family home, and a large share of the proceeds went to finance their first mission. This photo was taken at the last family gathering before they moved to the small apartment they would occupy for the rest of my father's life. My parents served among the first group of missionaries in Nigeria after the mission was officially organized on July 1, 1980. At left is their photo with President and Sister Espenscheid soon after their arrival in September 1980. At right, Elder Bradshaw is standing with members of the Port Harcourt branch, including the family of David W. Eka. My fam father wrote, quote, We had success in Port Harcourt, but the city of Aba proved to be an even more fruitful field where we baptize many members. As was true of, with each of the 28 branches in the Cross River State, the Bradshaws had been called to help supervise. An unofficial branch of the church in the large city of Aba had been organized by unbaptized local believers long before the arrival of the missionaries. In this photo from 1966, Sister Lynn Hansen is shown with some of these early believers. However, during the ensuing years, the self-organized Abba branch had dwindled, and my parents were assigned to op help open a new branch, this time under the official auspices of the church. At left is the scene of the first twelve baptisms in Abba, near a beautiful banana grove. The baptisms were performed by Elder Lamar S. Williams on January 22, 1981. For the previous six months, the couples had been instructed not to actively proselyte or baptize new members, but rather to focus on strengthening those who were already attending meetings. Now they could begin to teach and baptize those who showed interest. At right is a photo of Elder Bradshaw baptizing Brother Uduka Ituma of Abba on May 29th of the same year. According to my father, Brother Ituma, quote, had been looking for the true church all his life. He knew the Bible quite well, and he understood that Christ's true church would have a temple. He even started his own church called the Temple of the Lord's True Church, end of quote. When he heard the gospel message, he was greatly enthused and went all over Abba telling people about it. He brought many people to teach, and we baptized 20 people, including the Atoma family, said my father. Brother Atuma became the first president of the Abba branch. Rapid growth continued throughout the Bradshaw's assignment to Abba. I write as a photo of branch members on my parents last Sunday in Nigeria, September 20, 1981. On the day of the first baptisms in Abba, my father had commented to my mother that, quote, this can be a great branch someday. His comment was a prophetic understatement. The very first large chapel in West Africa was built in that city a few year years later. As new branches in the area proliferated, David W. Eka, who my parents had come to know in Port Harcourt, became president of the Abba district. Seven years later, Abba became the first stake of the church in West Africa. My parents, now on their third senior mission, were present at a training meeting for missionaries that Elder Neil A. Maxwell gave in Ibanan on his way to organize the stake. Afterward, during the conference itself, Elder Maxwell told the congregation that news of the stake's creation, quote, would flash around the world of the church 
and would be received with great rejoicing. I was present, continued Elder Maxwell, in the upper room of the temple that early June day in 1978, when all the general authorities gathered to receive the revelation and decision from President Spencer W. Kimball. I wept with joy that day. The handkerchief I wiped my tears, I took home and told my wife not to wash it. I put it in my book of remembrance, still bearing the marks of my tears of joy. On this Sunday, I have a second handkerchief that I have wiped that have wiped more tears of joy. I will take it home and place it in my book of remembrance next to the other handkerchief. End of quote. After the conference, El David W. Eka was set apart as stake president. Later, he served as a regional representative, Area 70, and mission president. On 7th of August, 2005, Aba became the site of the first temple in Nigeria. The great branch my father had envisioned in Aba had now become a center of strength for the entire country. What a joy as we learned while serving in Kinshasa of the celebrations being held in the summer of 2018 for the creation of the 100th stake in West Africa, 30 years after the organization of that first stake in Aba. Although my wife Kathleen and I had always planned on missionary service together following my retirement, our call to serve came much earlier than we had imagined. In August 2015, my brothers John and Scott and I were rebuilding part of a deck on a family cabin my father had built in a canyon near Midway, Utah in 1976. As we worked, John told me that he planned to retire and serve a mission the following summer. As it later turned out, John and his wife Anne were called to serve in the Legazpi Philippines mission, leaving about the same time as we eventually did. They had many wonderful experiences that paralleled our own, as well as some that were unique to their mission assignment. After Kathleen and I discussed John's plans for retirement and a mission, we felt that we should think more carefully about our own retirement. At that time, we assumed that our retirement was still eight to ten years away. I arranged a phone meeting in September with our accountant and longtime family friend, Doug Weaver. He and his wife had recently returned from a mission, and after looking at our situation, he encouraged us to think about serving a senior mission before we reached normal retirement age. He explained how advanced age and health issues often restrict the range of opportunities available for senior couples desiring to serve. In our case, Doug advised us not to wait until the maximum Social Security benefits kicked in at age 70, but to consider applying earlier, even as early as age 62. He said that if we were willing to live frugally, it could be done. As Doug spoke, I thought of my father's decision to retire at age 60 and of his untimely passing at age 71. The decade he and his mother spent during their 60s serving three missions and looking after their family full-time was the happiest period of their lives. That evening, the same day I had spoken to Doug, I participated in a meeting with her beloved stake president, Kevin Curtis. After the meeting, the two of us sat together in the chapel foyer talking, and he brought up the subject of our serving a couple mission. I had not said anything about my conversation with Doug earlier that day. Surprised, yet feeling some intimations of the Spirit in my heart, I said that I would pray about it with Kathleen. We fasted and prayed together, and a confirmation that we should put in our application to serve a mission soon came in an unmistakable fashion. In our missionary application, we said that we were available to serve wherever we were most needed. However, while we were spending the Christmas holidays with our daughter Elizabeth's family in Idaho, and before we had received our mission call, our son Thomas sent us a link to the current Senior Missionary Opportunities Bulletin. He had noticed a section headlined in red that listed urgent needs for senior couples. The two French-speaking opportunities especially caught our eye, and we decided to call the number listed to let them know that we would be, quote, interested in being considered for these assignments, end of quote. The brother who answered the phone was very solicitous and urged me to arrange a direct call with the DR Congo Kinshasa mission president. I asked who it was, and he said, Hervé Barrel. I replied, I know him. As a full-time missionary, our son Robert had served nine months in President Byrell's ward, located in the beautiful French town of Aix-en-Provence. 
Kathleen and I met President Byrell when we picked up Robert after his mission in 2001. Five years later, while Kathleen and I were serving as young adult advisors in the Toulouse-France stake, we worked with President Byrell, then a CES director, as he helped us with arrangements for institute graduation. Seventeen years later, all of us were reunited with the addition of Sister Byrell and our youngest son Samuel in the DR Congo Kinshasa mission office. After we arrived in Kinshasa, we realized that we had an even earlier connection with the Byrells. As a young missionary in 1976, I taught and baptized Omar Almar in the English Channel near Calais, France. Within a year, Omar similarly baptized his sister Malika. President Byrell told us that Malika was one of the young adults who had helped fellowship him as he studied with the missionaries before his baptism and eventually his full-time mission. After talking with President Byrell by phone about the possibility of serving in the DR Congo Kinshasa mission, he indicated his interest in our application, though of course emphasizing that the assignment was not his to make. Our assignment, like any other missionary assignment, would be proposed through apostolic inspiration, and final approval would come from the president of the church. It was a joy to serve with President and Sister Byrell, and certainly a humbling and eye-opening experience to see the wide range of challenges they faced, the inspiration they received, and the long hours they devoted to their calling. We couldn't imagine a couple more compatible to us in personal and administrative style and devotion than were the Byrells. One of our biggest concerns about leaving on a mission was to assure the personal situation of Michael Larson. Michael's mother Patricia had passed away suddenly in the summer of 2015, and as a result, Kathleen and I had become family for him. Patricia and Michael Larson had been introduced to the church in Budapest, Hungary, by Brent and Leslie Johnson. Their son Jacob attended the same school for the training of children with cerebral palsy as Michael. Patricia and Michael were baptized in 1999 and 2000. The following year, I happened to visit Budapest with my son Thomas. My cousin Warren Bradshaw and his wife Sandy were serving there as senior missionaries. While there, he be we became acquainted with the situation of Patricia and Michael Larson. Not long afterward, Patricia decided to move to Florida to help, to help care for her mother after her father died. She asked Elder and Sister Bradshaw to check and see what ward she would be in and to get her bishop's name and phone number. They looked up and found the leadership of the Navarre, Florida ward, and to their great surprise, they found that I was then serving as bishop. We are convinced that the Lord orchestrated the many unusual events in Patricia's and Michael's lives that eventually led to their conversion in Hungary and their move to Florida. We were grateful that though these event, through these events we became neighbors, friends, and eventually family with them. A few weeks after Patricia's passing, Michael received a sweet priesthood blessing of comfort and direction from Elder Marcus B. Nash. One of the greatest dreams of Michael and his mother had been that the way would eventually open for him to serve a mission. In anticipation of the possibility of a full-time mission for Michael, we helped him move to Utah, where association with other young single adults and missionary opportunities were more plentiful than in Pensacola, Florida. Because our assigned temple in Pensacola was many hours away, the logistics of visiting the temple for Michael had been daunting. In Utah, he was at last able to receive his temple endowments and to seal his mother to her parents. Because young church service missionaries in Michael's situation typically lived at home with family, we had indicated on our mission application that one possible option for our assignment would be to move to Utah in order to help Michael serve his mission. However, Michael was called to serve a mission in the Springville, Utah High School Seminary, while we were called to the DR Congo. Through the help of Springville Seminary teachers, the kind staff at his care facility in Orem, and arrangements with drivers who would accompany him as he performed his missionary assignments, an impossible situation was made possible. The three of us happily served a mission together while living far apart. Once more, the Lord had prepared a way. This is the end of part one of the Church in the DR Congo, A Personal Perspective. The next segment of this 
presentation series will be part two, Snapshot of the Church in the DR Congo.